Hi everybody, welcome to this next video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. Today we're joined by Mark Renz who will tell us a bit about managing perennial knotweeds in Wisconsin. Thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. Hopefully you've already seen my previous presentation about how to identify knotweeds. Now we're going to turn a tail here and talk about how, we're, how we can manage these species, which can be quite troublesome. Just as a quick review, we have several of these perennial knotweeds that are regulated plants in Wisconsin. Both giant knotweed and bohemian knotweed are considered prohibited by Wisconsin's NR40 rule while uh, Japanese knotweed is considered restricted. To our knowledge, we have a little less than a thousand species or locations known for these knotweed species. And it's a little bit unclear on which species those are because many of those are classified as Japanese knotweed, but there's some new data that suggests that they're actually Bohemian knotweed, which is the hybrid between giant and Japanese. So cause for some confusion. But the good news is that managing any of these populations, uh, regardless of which species it is, is similar. So any of the methods and techniques we're gonna talk about today can, can be utilized on any of these species. So today I'm gonna talk about just effective management methods. There's been a wide range that have been studied, but really I'm gonna focus on just the three known techniques that have been shown to have some level of consistent success. So I'm not gonna talk about mowing which is in the picture here, because it's well known that we can mow plants multiple times a year, and it really doesn't provide us with any long-term control. So today I'm gonna to talk about three techniques. The first technique I'm gonna focus on is excavation. We're then gonna talk about some techniques using mulch or smothering the plant. And then we're gonna focus the remaining portion of our talk on how we can utilize herbicides for effective long-term control. So first, I want to talk about excavation or removal. This is uh, widely known to be an effective technique and is actually widely used in Europe uh, for control of Japanese knotweed. Um, this is a very labor-intensive process, as can be seen by this picture, where we're actually digging through the soil, removing the soil. Once that soil is removed, we're actually going to sift the soil to remove any known root or rhizome fragments. And as you can see, with large infestations like are widespread in Europe, this can be a quite a large feat, and there can be quite a lot of perennial fragments that are removed via this process. So this process is very successful, but it's very labor intensive. They're digging down five, six, sometimes upwards of 10 feet to, to remove these perennial organs. So again, not for the lighthearted or people that uh, don't like to do lots of digging because this is what's going to happen when we're going to use excavation and or removal. In conjunction with this, you're also left with a lot of disturbance that you're going to have to do some sort of restoration or uh, revegetation. The other technique I want to talk about is, uh, I think, best term smothering. It's been highlighted and summarized by a range of different in individuals. I'm gonna to reference to this New Hampshire Department of Agriculture fact sheet, and these are the pictures from this fact sheet, because I thought they did a really good job of highlighting this technique and how it's most effective. What they recommend is the first step is to come out sometime in the summer and cut those knotweed stems down to the ground. Um, you wanna cut those as low to the ground as possible and remove those cut stems from that area. Then the second step is to apply something over the cut stems. And really the goal of making applying something over the cut stems is to prevent them from cutting through any material or poking holes in this tarp that we're gonna lay down. So in this picture to your right, what you're seeing is they're just laying down an old tarp. Uh, most commonly they're using ample amounts of mulch over those cut stems can work as well. So those are the first two steps that they approach. Then after that step, then what they're going to do is cover that existing area with a heavy plastic material. Usually we're, we're thinking of a very heavy plastic material that's going to prevent breakage over time. And when you lay that material down, you want to lay it down, extend around five feet beyond the edge of that infestation to make sure that you can capture any creeping roots or rhizomes that could potentially uh, come out from that existing edge. 
Once you lay that down, you then want to cover that tarp with uh, a bunch of mulch, some small rocks, so that it won't be disturbed over time. In many cases, a lot of times you can disturb the soil around that leading edge and tuck that tarp into the disturbed soil, and that helps with preventing it from getting uprooted over time. Then what New Hampshire Department of Agriculture recommends is you leave this area undisturbed for at least five years. And so for five years, you don't want any light getting through this tarp into the soil surface. Uh, otherwise, you can have uh, ample uh, plants surviving and overcoming this control strategy. Others have had success in as little as three years, but I think five years is a realistic um, time frame, especially for some of these longer term infestations. Along with these four ideas, I would add a fifth where you want to go back to this area periodically and scout to make sure that you don't have new populations that are popping up outside of where you did put this tarp. So for the remainder of this talk, I want to focus in on herbicides. Um, herbicides are widely used for controlling Japanese knotweed, and usually they're the most cost-efficient method. We have herbicides out there that, if applied correctly, can give greater than 90% control for over one year, in some cases up to two years. Um, I want to emphasize that applications can be made in a wide range of, of ways. We're going to focus on applications that are broadcasted to an area or broadcasted uh, foliarly to treated individual plants. A lot of other methods um, will recommend injecting herbicides into stems. We're not going to talk about that in too much detail. There's a little bit of evidence that shows that, that we really get reduced control compared to some of the other control techniques, uh, and it's really isolated to controlling those, in, those stems where you actually put the herbicide in, and it doesn't translocate as well. So we're not going to focus on that method. Um, and we're going to talk about a wide range of herbicides that we've looked at in trying to control Japanese knotweed, and others have looked at, at a more extensive list. The key point I want to make is though we have a, a range of herbicides that are available. Each of these herbicides has a different combination of active ingredients in them, and those herbicides have a range of properties that we need to be aware of. And two of the main properties that I highlight in this table is before we use a herbicide, we need to know, is this herbicide a selective herbicide or is it not a selective herbicide? In this case, if there's established grasses here, will it harm those established grasses or not to know? And another important piece of information to know is, do these herbicides, after I apply them, have residual activity? Or do they persist in the soil and remain active after that application time frame? And that's important when we're integrating revegetation into those. And you can find this information on the label as well as other educational resources, but it's really important to know those two pieces of information. So when you're thinking about using a herbicide to manage any of these perennial knotweeds, like Japanese knotweed, we really urge you to think about three main things before uh, purchasing a herbicide and starting to use it. The first thing we want you to think about is what is the product and is it, where is it labeled for use? You'll find that some products are only labeled for aquatic situations, while others might be labeled for non-crop roadside situations. Well, very few are labeled actually for these urban or homeowner settings, and we need to be aware of that. Secondarily, we need to think about, well, what other plants present um, or am I planning on seeding after control? And what, what will these herbicides do if I spray these onto these plants or will they persist in the environment and impact the establishment of those afterwards? And then the final thing I'd, I'd like to encourage you to think about is how big is this infestation? because that's really gonna determine the type of management technique you're gonna to wanna to utilize, and more importantly, the budget you need in order to manage these plants. Because sometimes if it's a really large patch, you're gonna uh, really need to do quite a bit of planning before jumping into control. So here's just some examples of some of the effectiveness you can get with several of our herbicides. On your left, you see some results one year after, after correct application with milestone in the fall. And we're comparing that into uh, an application of arsenal in the fall. And these plots, the one year before, were 80 to 90% Japanese knotweed. And now you can see it's a cl uh, almost completely eliminated from knotweed. So we can get high levels of success with a wide range of these herbicides. But we need to be aware, as I mentioned before, on what are some of the residual activities of these herbicides. 
As you can see, Arsenal has, is a non-selective herbicide that has really high levels of residual activity, and we have very few to no plants growing one year after treatment. Whereas Milestone, while equally as effective at this rate and timing, uh, does not have as much residual activity, and therefore some of our desirable plants, particularly our uh, desirable grasses, have survived this application and are reestablishing in this. So we've been doing research for over six years with this group of species. And instead of showing you six years worth of summarized figures and, and tables, we thought we'd just summarize kind of what our results that we've seen. In essence, we've seen that the active ingredient imazapir, which is in arsenal and habitat, has really been our most effective herbicide that we've used. It's really effective if we apply it in the summer or, the, or throughout into the fall. The one downside with that is that when we do use this, as shown with the previous slide, is we get bare ground for one year after application because of the residual activity. And that residual activity likely is going to impact our revegetation uh, procedures that we're going to have to utilize. Milestone, the active ingredient in Milestone is aminopyrrolate, has also showed some promise. We've been able to get equivalent control to arsenal only when we apply it in that fall timing right before a frost. Often it coincides with when those white flowers are present. Uh, we've found the best results are when we can apply it at up to a 14 fluid ounce per acre rate, which is considered a spot treatment rate, and you're only allowed to apply it to a small portion of the infested area. And the biggest benefit with Milestone is it's safe to establish grasses. So if you have some of those established grasses nearby, uh, it's not going to do any harm to them, and they will, um, they will survive that treatment. The downside is that it does have some residual activity to some of our other broadleaf species. The third herbicide that we found success with is the active ingredient glyphosate, you're most commonly aware of as Roundup. And we have found it to be really effective, but we will, and equally effective to milestone and arsenal or habitat, but we need to apply it at a really, really high rate to get that level of effectiveness, upwards of a 9% uh, solution. The reason we mention this uh, as an option, though, is because this is really the only effective herbicide that a homeowner or is registered for use in an urban environment. -wise. Both Milestone and Arsenal or Habitat are not registered for use in an urban type of in homeowner environment. So as far as how we make these applications with these, with these herbicides, I want, what we've learned over the last six years is a, a few really critical points. First off, we found that applications in the fall prior to a frost is where when we tend to get the best results with some products like Arsenal, we can make those applications in summer and get equivalent control. But with most of them, that fall timing right around when flowering is occurring is when we get those best results. Um, there's been a lot of anecdotal information that suggests that mowing and letting those plants re-sprout can improve our level of control. We've actually done several different series of experiments um, that have shown that we do, it is not required to mow those plants in order to obtain high levels of control. But what we found is mowing can actually make those applications much more easier because when you mow those plants uh, once or twice, let them re-sprout for a month before a fall application, instead of those plants being eight to 10 feet tall, they're only two to three feet tall, making that application much, much easier uh, and safer to apply. I think the, the last point that we've gotten a lot of mixed um, or questions about is uh, the volume of, of herbicide that we need to apply to get high levels of control. And anecdotally, a lot of people have said you need to use up to 80 to 100, I'm sorry, gallons of volume of, of herbicide solution per acre to get high levels of control. We actually did an experiment where we applied 20, 40, 80, or 100 gallons per acre, and we didn't find any significant difference in the level of control. Um, as long as we're applying at the correct label rate, uh, application volume didn't appear to give any improvement or reduction in control. So we have some tools that we can utilize to eradicate knotweed. We've, we've done a lot of work on herbicides. What we were really interested in is that um, can we use these herbicides to eradicate knotweed that's infesting some of our roadsides in south southeastern Wisconsin? So we really wanted to evaluate how effective these were on a roadside environment and how much they were going to cost. 
Because it was a roadside environment, we had eight locations in southeast Wisconsin. We decided to use milestone because it would be safe to any grasses that were present. We mowed those plots in July to make those applications and set to re-sprouting tissue in September much more easy to utilize. And we applied milestone at 14 fluid ounces at that time frame. And then what we did is we uh, also tracked how much it cost to both uh, spray the herbicide and time for the staff to mow and conduct that treatment in every year. So that would really give us a good idea of how much it was going to cost. And then we tracked how well we were controlling those species over time. So in our initial year, we came out in July and mowed these plants and then came back out in September to treat these in 2014. And this is just a picture of what one of the sites looked like. As you can see, right along that roadside, we have that population resprouting and around one to two feet tall. Uh, the cover varied from anywhere to 80 to 99% across those eight sites. But we treated all those sites with our 14 fluid ounces of milestone, estimating our time in mowing and our time to for applying the herbicide and the herbicide. It cost us around $19 per thousand square feet. So a pretty substantial cost in that first year. But then we came back the next year, and here's just a different roadside, and here's an example of what it looks like. You saw we got pretty decent control, but many of those light green patches are resprouting Japanese knotweed, or in this case, bohemian knotweed. So we didn't get 100% control. So what we did is we arbitrarily set a threshold of 25% cover, and if a population was above 25% cover, we would go ahead and retreat that. So this was just above that 25% threshold. So we went ahead and retreated that in September of that following year. Uh, just to let you know that we had a wide range in control across those sites. On average, our control was much less than our control studies. On average, we had 37% control, but anywhere from 10 to 80%. Not too surprising. These roadsides are pretty caustic environments compared to our controlled sites. So we were anticipating a little bit lower level of control. Uh, because of this range of control, we retreated seven of those eight sites because it was above that 25% threshold, uh, seven of those eight sites. But what you'll notice is since we have a much smaller population, our cost for retreatment was much less, only $4 per thousand square feet, uh, because much less time was needed, much less herbicide was needed to retreat those sites. Then coming back in the third year, we saw much better results. You can see we still had some populations that were popping up again, uh, but we were getting much more fill-in of desirable vegetation along those areas where we didn't see it. We ended up retreating on this in this area, and we had uh, we had to retreat two of those seven sites because they were those two sites were still above that 25% threshold, but. Um, five of those sites we did not need to retreat uh, at all. You may be wondering what happened to our eighth site. We lost that due to someone who really wanted to get rid of that Japanese knotweed, so they sprayed it out themselves. But that, So while we still have to treat these after three years, we're seeing that cost of treatment is continuing to decline and is now well less than uh, $1 per thousand square feet. So to kind of sum up over, those, uh, over that time to control, in our first year uh, we had really large populations of knotweed, although they were small. They covered uh, over 90% average cover of knotweed in that establishment year. One year after, con after control treatments, we were still above 60% in knotweed cover. And it really took that repeated applications over two years. And then we were below, on average, below 20%, but we still had residual populations that, that were still popping up over time. And so we were not able to eradicate any of these populations uh, with continual treatment over a three-year time frame. And again, here's kind of summarizing what our costs are. Costs initially were really, really high, uh, but after that first initial year, costs were much more affordable. Really suggesting if you're gonna go after knotweed, you really need to have either uh, saved your money in order to control that over the first year, or hopefully you can get a grant to cover some of those extra costs. And then really uh, the key is to be in a maintenance phase after that, and that'll really uh, be much more, much more cost efficient. So I think the kind of 
elephant in the closet, so to speak, is that we can get good control about these populations, but what about restoration? Uh, many of these cases, we were using milestone thinking that there were desirable grasses nearby. The reality was when we got good control, as you can see here along the leading edge, um, we didn't have any grasses underneath, so it didn't really matter that we applied a herbicide that was safe to grasses. There was really limited desirable vegetation present underneath the knotweed. We did have vegetation present, it really wasn't desirable vegetation that was coming in. Here's a close-up of one of our locations where we got good control. What you're seeing that's coming back in is Canada thistle, some of our biennial thistles, creeping charlie, and other rural species that we really wouldn't find desirable in a roadside setting too. So I think revegetation is going to need to be another key component that's involved in this in this management of this species, and we just didn't have the time and resources to include this in our um, in our research that we can. So kind of to sum up, uh, in conclusion, there's a range of tools that we can utilize to suppress knotweed. But any of those tools look like we're going to have to have uh, extensive follow-up, likely for greater than three years, even though we really just compared herbicides that are effective. I think that all of those techniques are going to need follow-up for three plus years. And, and if we are going to use a herbicide, while there's a range of herbicide, herbicides that are effective, we really need to look closely at some of those details to select that appropriate herbicide. And there's lots of resources out there and experts to help you. And uh, in extension, we have a good fact sheet, but we just ask that you uh, seek out help in selecting your herbicide for your, that's appropriate for your situation. And then, you know, finally, you know, if you are going to go out and control this, think about how you're going to integrate reed vegetation into those sites after control. That's clearly going to be another important issue. Uh, we feel like that's a real big gap that future research needs to fill that in. So that's just a brief summary of what we've done and what's known about control of knotweed. It is not easy to control, so um, we wish you the best of luck and, and know that it's going to be a pretty hard task. And with the time left, I'd like to thank the people involved in this uh, process because we had a whole bunch of people that helped us with this project, a bunch of people from our, our, our lab that were involved in making these applications and measuring these results as well as Dow AgriSciences provided some funding and we work really closely with the Southeast Wisconsin Invasive Species Consortium uh, for our knotweed work on the roadside. We wanna thank them for their efforts involved. Uh, with that, I'd love to answer questions that Ann may have uh, with, reg with regards to controlling these knotweed species. So earlier in the presentation when you were talking about uh, excavating knotweed, you mentioned that part of the process involves removing all of the roots and sieving the soil to remove all of that root matter. Why is it so important to go through that process? It seems like a huge extra step to take. Absolutely it is. And, and the reason why we're trying to get rid of all those roots is that this is a perennial plant and these roots and rhizomes is where we can get new shoots that can um, reinfest that area. So if we were just to remove the crowns and leave all those small roots, even pencil diameter size roots and rhizomes can lead to reinfestation. So that's what's really critical, but it is a very uh, huge task. Some people may think, well, maybe I'll just remove all that soil and just dump it somewhere else. And while that's effective, you're, you're essentially probably creating a new infestation. And that's one way we've documented seeing a lot of these infestations spread is by removing topsoil that's infested with these root species. Okay, so if somebody wants to use the smothering technique um, and they're initially cutting or mowing the knotweed, they need to remove that as well. What's a good way to deal with the knotweed that you've cut so that you're not reinfesting your site or infesting a new site? Yeah, and so I think what you're alluding to, Ann, is that the stems of the knotweed can reroot and cause new inv invasions as well. Right. So that can happen. That tends to happen on rare occasions. So what needs to happen, it, it, the reports that we've heard is that the when the stems are cut, and they're cut in large segments, they have enough stored energy. If they're placed in a wet environment, they can reroot and cause a new infestation. That is rare. Our experience with our control techniques have found that if we can grind those stems up with a mower, 
we, we really minimize, if not eliminate that, uh, that threat. Uh, I think it's always good when, when you are grinding it up with a mower, wherever that material is ground up, to continue that with frequent monitoring to make sure that none of those actually reroute. If you can put that in a controlled area or compost it or something like that, that will also help as well. The key is that you just don't assume that it's, it's, it's safe. Try and grind it up into as small as pieces as you can with your equipment and put it in an area where you can monitor it. So if you find a new population of knotweed, maybe along a roadside or in your neighbor's yard, what can you do about it? Yeah, I mean, this is where it really becomes becomes a challenge. So, you know, let's say that uh, in this picture, I'm standing in front of this beautiful bohemian knotweed population. Let's say if that's um, from a neighbor and it's coming into my yard. Well, again, this is where identifying the species is really important. If it's a bohemian knotweed, that's a that's a prohibited species. So you could call DNR and uh, ask that the the, that they require the landowner to control that species. Um, if you do that, I would pretty much guarantee you that you're probably your neighbor will get really upset. <laughs> and so we would encourage having a conversation with that landowner first and making them aware of that issue. So those property ownership issues become really a challenge uh, in managing this. So having the conversation first, if it's coming in from someone else's property, I think is the most critical. If it's giant or bohemian knotweed, there's, there's a mechanism to require control. If it's Japanese knotweed, there's no mechanism since it's only a restricted species in Wisconsin. There's no mechanism to control it. But hopefully you can have a conversation about what the impacts uh, this species is having. So if I were to find a new infestation of Japanese knotweed in my yard, or maybe I just realized that I have a knotweed in my yard, what can I do to manage it? We get that question a lot. And so first off, uh, out of the herbicides that we've researched, really the only one that's that's really effective is glyphosate in that situation. So that would be your only herbicidal option that has shown uh, high levels of success. Most A lot of people, particularly in the Madison area, are opposed to using herbicides. So in that case, we're really reliant on um, our non-herbicidal methods, which really comes down to smothering or, it, or um, excavation. People usually don't like smothering either, though, because say it's in a small area in your backyard uh, where you garden and you want to garden that area, you need to keep that smothered for three to five years. And so it's a really large task. So in many of those cases, really the most logical solution is excavation. Um, and that's no simple task, but it can be effective. And it's probably the most effective urban management technique. So is excavation then the quickest way that I could get rid of the knotweed in my yard? Yeah, I would say that's probably the quickest, but the most labor intensive too, is kind of the other approach. There are have been others that have used glyphosate or Roundup and they've injected it into the stems and gotten moderate success. But again, the people I've talked to have done that over several years time, repeatedly injecting that. And that's using a lot of herbicide and I would argue, again, they don't have access to using that area for multiple years because uh, they still have to continually treat it. Either way, it's going to be a, an intense process. Whether you're excavating, you need to do a lot of labor with that or you need to spend a lot of time with smothering or repeated herbicide treatments. Yeah, I think that's, you know, maybe that's the key take home message is that there's a lot of effort involved in controlling this plant. And so plan carefully so that you can maximize the time and energy you spend on this and and really being diligent and going back to those areas many times many many consecutive years is how we're going to have long-term success the worst thing you can do is do a lot of work in one year and then not go back to that site for two or three years because all your work will be gone when you go back three or four years later Thanks a lot, Mark, for coming in and telling us about some management options for our perennial knotweeds in Wisconsin. Uh, for those of you that are wondering a little bit more about how to identify knotweeds, we have another video available about that. And we also have the extension fact sheet available about identifying and managing knotweeds. And you can find both of those on the Wifton website. Thank you for watching this video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. 
To learn more about our network or to access additional information about invasive species in Wisconsin, please visit our website or contact us.